Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Marion Hutchings. Um, Becky is going to present the second half of our presentation. But I also want to introduce the third member of our team, um, Dr. Philip Kirby, who's somewhere. Um, whose work on this report has been absolutely invaluable. Um, we're not ignoring that. So, the last presentation gave you the big picture. Um, our analysis has a much more specific focus. Um, outcomes for disadvantaged pupils in sponsored academies. So, only that little bit of the big picture. Successive governments have promoted sponsored academies and have claimed that they're successful in breaking the cycle of disadvantage. So the Academy's annual report for 2013-14 said the growth in sponsored academies has transformed the performance of the most disadvantaged pupils by turning around the worst performing schools in the country, helping to realise our vision for real social justice and a good education for all. And the current government believes that multi-academy trusts, or MACs, are the most effective ways to organise academies and has promoted these in the white paper. So our research is about the success or otherwise of those two strategies. A brief word about terminology. Groups of academies are now almost universally referred to as MACs. But not all the groups are actually MACs. Some have more than one MAC. They may be umbrella trusts, bringing together MACs and single academy trusts. And so we prefer to use the earlier term, chain. The DFB defined a chain as a group of three or more academies under a single sponsor. And for example, AET, according to the DFB list, consists of two MACs plus a single academy trust. So it gets a bit confusing to talk about maths in our view. The distinctive thing about our work that's already been mentioned is that we've now done it for three years running, and so we can compare over time as well as across academy chains. So we explored how well disadvantaged pupils in each chain have done compared with all disadvantaged pupils in mainstream schools nationally using a range of attainment measures, um, five for A star to C, um, points score, progress, and EVAC. We've compared the change in attainment between 2013 and 15, over two years, with national figures. And then we combined the figures to produce a single index of chains for attainment and one for improvement. A key aspect of any research about academy performance is the decision about which academies you include. Sponsored academies are about a third of all academies, but our analysis focuses only on those in chains, according to the definition I gave. Only those that were under the same sponsor for three academic years leading up to the 2015 exams. So you would expect that sponsor to have made a substantial impact the kids taking the exams would have had more than half their education under that chain. Um, we're only looking at secondary academies because the number of primary academies in 2015 that met our criteria was quite small. There were a few chains we could have included, but the number of pupils was also very small, so we thought it was better to leave that another year. We've only included schools with results for 2013, 14, and 15, so we know that excludes some academies that set up as fresh start, as new starts, with year seven pupils, because they haven't necessarily got the results yet. And we only included chains where a sponsor had at least two secondary sponsored academies that could be included. For most of the chains we looked at, this represented a substantial proportion of their sponsored secondary academies, um, mostly well over half. There was one exception where it was only two out of ten, which is a chain that's grown exceedingly quickly. And so we may not be representing their full results, but that's because they've grown so fast. In this talk, clearly we're only giving you a, a snapshot of the sort of things we've done and examples of the data you've got the report in your packs. So we reviewed overall performance, 
looking at Ofsted grades and um, those schools which were below the floor standard. And the sponsored academies in our analysis group have lower inspection grades, twice as many were inadequate, and twice as many were below the floor standard compared with all secondary schools. Obviously, we know that schools that become sponsored academies are particularly challenging, but because we've chosen to focus on it, only those that have been part of a chain for three years, one might hope for more improvement. But the key point, the same one that John made, is that there is variation between chains, and that's the thing that comes out throughout. In terms of the Ofsted results, in nine of our chains, all the academies in our analysis group were good or outstanding. Whereas in four chains, all the academies in the analysis group were inadequate or requires improvement. And this is evident in every aspect of our analysis. Oops. No. Next. Oh. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is just an example. It shows the 5A star to C, including English and maths. And you probably can't read the names, but it is in your pack. But what you'll see is the red column is the national average figure. And quite a lot of chains are just below that. But a few at the top did hugely much better than the national average, and a few at the bottom did very much worse. And this one shows the percentage of disadvantaged pupils achieving EBAC. And the variation is even more there. The figure of the disadvantaged pupils in a chain achieving EBAC ranged from 2% to 30%, compared with a national figure of 12%. We found, having made all these different lists for the different attainment measures, on the whole, the same chains do well or badly on most of the measures. There are exceptions, and they show in the report. And also, the chains that are successful with disadvantaged pupils are also the most successful for pupils who are not disadvantaged. And the less successful ones tend to have poor results for both groups. We found, comparing across the years, the proportion of chains performing above the mainstream average within our analysis has fallen each year. Obviously, we are looking at slightly different chains, and the composition of each chain has changed. But nevertheless, it was quite striking that in 2013, half the chains in the analysis group were above the mainstream average for 5 based off C and it's only a third this year. And similarly, the number of chains below average for maths and English progress has increased. We also considered improvements, as I said, from 2013 to 15. So this slide shows chains that improved or changed performance more better, you know, did better than the mainstream average and those that did worse. And it's about half and half of the chains. However, we know that if you're a school with very low results, they're more likely to go up than in a school that has good results at the outset. So we also did an analysis comparing each chain with schools with similar improvement initially. And doing that, we found that more than half the chains didn't improve as much as those with similar initial attainment. So the final thing we did was combine the various attainment figures to create our overall index for attainment and improvement, and their tables 10 and 11 in the report. Over the three years we've done this analysis, the number of chains has increased, the number of schools has changed, but it's striking how little change there has been in the ranking of the chains over the three years. Only a minority have moved up or down. So a handful of chains have performed consistently, significantly above the mainstream average across the last three years. Arc, City of London, Harris, Mercers. Outward Grange moved up into this category last year, David Mellor this year. So these are the chains that are transforming the prospects of disadvantaged pupils. But a few chains have remained significantly in the significantly below average group across the three years. 
Diocese of Salisbury, Learning Schools, SPTA and Woodard. Now we are aware that action is already being taken or is being taken in at least three of those chains to change the chain constitution. And one of the things we would like to do in the future is follow those schools that are being moved from one sponsor to another and see what happens to them. And then finally, we've compared improvement and attainment. Obviously, the improvement ranking is more volatile. You can't necessarily improve as much every year, particularly if you're very good. Um, but we've shown it on a scatter graph, which is figure 30 in the report. In 2015, five chains were above average for both improvement and attainment, but eight chains were below average for both, and three of these, it's the second successive year, have been in that low group. So, Becky's going to talk about what all this means. Just a couple of words then about implications. I mean, the striking thing is that our conclusions now for three years remain consistent. Some chains are demonstrating outstanding capacity and impact. A large number are concentrated about around the mainstream average for improvement and or attainment. And a small number of chains, but notably a larger number than the high achieving chains, are significantly underperforming on outcomes for their disadvantaged kids and are failing to improve. So this analysis really shows the urgency of acting on these findings for the sake of the disadvantaged young people concerned. To be clear, to find cases of change where attainment for disadvantaged young people is significantly low, hasn't improved in three years, within an intervention specifically designed to improve the prospects of that group of young people, is very worrying. For three years in a row, we've reiterated our original finding that Far from providing a solution to disadvantage, a few chains may be exacerbating it. Yet sometimes those chains don't appear to have been strongly or consistently challenged or, of course, supported to improve. Now, we recognise, as Marin said, that in some cases, regional schools commissioners are taking steps to address those problems, and we hope that our analysis can support the urgency of those interventions. On the other side of the coin, the transformative impact and success of some chains in improving outcomes for their disadvantaged students does show the promise of the policy intervention, and I'm very glad to say that many of those chains are represented here today. But our findings show that that success isn't being quickly replicated. So we feel that this is an opportunity to take stock. The White Paper was right to focus on spreading capacity in the system, but the joint findings that are being presented here today suggest that full academisation and delivery through MAPS will simply replicate existing patchiness of our system. We need to focus on extending and building what works. So we've got a couple of specific uh, recommendations uh, that we're advocating in the report, and you can, of course, find them there. You, I, I think you can read these, it's not small on the screen, um, so I'll try to just uh, elaborate as well. We're saying that um, the government, National Schools Commissioner and Regional Schools Commissioners must act urgently to spread good practice. Again, uh, John mentioned this earlier, from the best academy chains to the rest. And in the report, we've suggested actually that the creation of a task force probably led by the National Schools Commissioner and comprised of uh, senior leadership team members and trust members from successful chains to support struggling maths. And we think that the government needs to urgently commission robust research into the successful practices of our best chains. The government must also concentrate on the development of capacity. This is evidently really important. Um, we've advocated this year on year, and it's vital that it should be followed through. Sorry, it's a new slide. Um, so within this, new chains shouldn't be allowed to expand until they have a track record of success. Um, 
The, in April, the Education Secretary told the Education Select Committee that new chains wouldn't be allowed to expand until they have a proven track record in bringing about improvements in their existing academies. But actually, our analysis seems to suggest that some chains are expanding very rapidly uh, without that evidence. Um, we think that RSCs should continue to tighten that quality criteria. And in our last report, we advocated that that, should be, that criteria should be based on quality, capacity, strategic model, and track record. Perhaps not rocket science, but not always clearly evidence. And importantly, we feel that the DfE should allow regional schools commissioners to expand their pool of school improvement providers beyond academy sponsors, prioritising quality and track record over time. So here we are really advocating that the best in our system should be able to be used effectively to spread good practice, whoever those providers are. I think this, this important point um, about building system leadership is really important too, and funding training there. Obviously, regional schools commissioners are already working to, um, to, to drive down on um, chains that are failing to deliver, but this really needs to be sharpened and the processes um, be made more transparent. I think it's really timely that we seem to be moving away from a sort of targets-driven culture on just more and more academies um, to enable a focus on what is really working for children. And there's this point again and again about transparency. You know, parents need to be able to know which chains are performing and which aren't. Um, we welcome the DfE's publication of its own analysis on the attainment of different academy chains, and we hope that that will be an annual event. Um, we would also advocate that um, it should be, this information should be provided by an independent provider, and um, we, we, we feel that Austin may be best place to do that. We also feel that the government should reiterate its uh, commitment to the original vision and purpose of the Sponsor Academies programme to transform the prospects of young people from disadvantaged backgrounds. You know, that was the key, uh, as, as, as Lee Elliott Major said at the beginning, the key aim of the Sponsor programme. And um, the government should be publicly evaluating outcomes of the policy programme against that intention. And then for sponsors and schools, recommendations really about actively trying to seek out and share um, best practice. Um, evidently, what we do know is that in the best trusts, there are clear lines of responsibility and accountability for school improvement within the chain, and that needs to be uh, replicated widely. And of course, we advocate that schools and sponsors should make full use of research evidence. We have the Education Endowment Foundation Southern Trust Toolkit on what works in um, increasing attainment for disadvantaged kids. We also have a raft of academic work on school effectiveness and so on. And um, this, this evidence needs to be spread. So we hope that implementation will support the Academy's programme to extend the present achievements of successful chains to others. But we also welcome the opportunity created by this multiple publication now of analysis and results over time for taking stock and thinking afresh about how we might spread excellent practice wherever it's found across our notoriously patchy education system in order to best realise the original policy intentions to ensure equitable life chances for all young people. Thank you very much for listening.